Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Washington Institute. I'm Rob Sotloff, the director, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you to this very special event with our very special guest speaker. Uh, before we begin, though, if I could ask everyone to, to join me in, in sending collective best wishes uh, through uh, the time zones um, uh, um, to uh, Shimon Perez, um, uh, a truly great leader and wonderful man, wishing him all, all success in recovering from, from his illness. Um, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be able to introduce uh, today's speaker. Um, uh, I first met um, uh, Moshe Yalon uh, in uh, autumn of 1995. Uh, by then, he had already had quite a reputation um, for exploits on the battlefield. Um, when I met him, he was serving as Israel's head of military intelligence. Um, uh, and I met him at a, it, it was a, it was an interesting and what was then a rare moment, especially if you're looking back over the last 21 years. It was a moment of hope and optimism. This was uh, just before the signing of the Oslo II Accords. Um, this was uh, uh, at a time when maybe, just maybe, um, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict um, was, was approaching the finish line. Well, um, in walked uh, to the King David Hotel, uh, this uh, uh, tall, experienced soldier, to brief a group of visiting Americans, and boy, was he sober. Boy, was he a downer. He just rained on that parade. Um, and he did it with the facts. He did it with uh, knowledge. Um, uh, he explained why the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, regrettably, was not ending anytime soon. And then, of course, um, uh, uh, the facts proved him right. Um, uh, what was so impressive about that first interaction with um, uh, Bogi Yalon, General Yalon, uh, was not the substance of what he said, but that here was a, um, a general who was willing to speak truth to power inconveniently against the waves, against the wind, um, and take it wherever it may go. Uh, uh, that was courageous then, that was brave then, that showed integrity and values then, and for the next 21 years, as I have known him and followed his career, um, that has been the hallmark of Bogi Yalon ever since. Um, he eventually rose through the ranks to serve as Israel's chief of the general staff at a time of great challenge. Uh, 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 it was his responsibility to um, uh, uh, to deal with um, the second Palestinian uprising, the Al-Aqsa Intifada, um, and to do what was necessary to, to deal with that. Um, he led Israel through that challenge. And then when he concluded his military service, uh, I was, uh, um, uh, it was a great privilege for all of us at the Washington Institute that he came here and spent uh, nine months as a visiting fellow um, at the Washington Institute uh, in 2006. Um, then went back to Israel, transitioned out of uniform into a political career, uh, joined the Likud, got elected to Knesset, entered the cabinet, um, and began service as Minister of Strategic Affairs, and um, three very eventful, very important um, uh, years as Israel's Minister of Defense. Um, uh, uh, years that saw um, Israel dealing with the challenge of, uh, of uh, rising nuclear Iran, a challenge of conflict on the, um, on the Gaza border, a challenge of the rise of uh, um, uh, Hezbollah missile and rocket, uh, rocket threats, and of course the, the, the dissolution of the Arab state system um, uh, 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 with the, uh, the tumult and chaos and upheaval of the last number of years, especially, but not solely, in Syria. I think it's fair to say that, that uh, uh, one of the, the rare pieces 
of, uh, of good news in the Middle East in the last half dozen of years is um, uh, the stability and security that Israel has been able to enjoy in this environment of chaos and instability. And that, I think it is also fair to say, is in no small part due to the leadership, um, the calm, and the determination of uh, Moshe Yalon. Um, uh, he left the cabinet, as you all know, in May, um, and I was uh, uh, very pleased when he accepted our invitation to come to the Institute as our Rosenblatt Distinguished Fellow, spending the month here talking, listening, exchanging ideas uh, before returning to Israel and embarking on the next stage of his career. Uh, it has been uh, a privilege for all of us to have him here, um, and now um, it's uh, my privilege to welcome him to this podium so he can offer some, uh, some remarks about his views of where we are and where we're going. Then he and I will have a bit of a conversation, and then I'll open up the floor to all your questions. Um, and uh, by the time we leave today, hopefully um, you'll even get all your answers. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, my, uh, my friend and our Rosenblatt Distinguished Fellow, Moshe Bogi Ya'alok. Thank you. Thank you, Rob, for the introduction. Uh, thank you for the hospitality in the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. As Rob mentioned, it's my second time as a fellow. It happened after my retirement as a chief of general staff, now after my retirement as a defense minister. I'm thinking about my next retirement. <laughs> <coughs> but uh, I'm honored and glad to be in the Institute. Uh, to be here, as I believe that uh, here in Washington, many decisions made are affecting the situation of all of us in the Middle East and, of course, in Israel. And am I here to listen, to speak, to write, to share my observations uh, regarding the challenges that I believe ahead of us. So uh, thank you for that. And thanks to everybody who with us today. Uh, and I hope that I'll be able to answer your questions in a way that will illustrate my way of thinking, analysis, and my proposals regarding the challenges ahead of us in the Middle East. And uh, personally, I would like to join uh, the wishes to our former president, Perez, for recovery from his current challenge in hospital. Uh, we wish, we wish, I wish him uh, all the best. Yesterday, the uh, Memorandum of, uh, of Understanding uh, between the U.S. administration and the Israeli government has been concluded, and I congratulate for it, as I started to work on it uh, more than three years ago, when President Obama came to Israel on March 2013 and declared that he is determined to conclude it. It took, us, it, it took us quite a while, but I'm glad that it has been uh, concluded. And it is another demonstration of uh, the very deep, close, I would say, strategic relationship between the United States and the State of Israel. Uh, we do appreciate very much the U.S. commitment to keep uh, the qualitative military edge of the State of Israel for our safety. Uh, and I believe that it is another cornerstone for our deterrence regarding the challenges in the region, which I believe is part for what we believe should be the goal to be achieved in the Middle East. First of all, stability rather than hostilities. <coughs> And uh, it's another opportunity for me to, to, to thank very much to the former Secretary of Defense, my friend Chuck Hegel, and the current, another friend, Ash Carter, 
for uh, allowing the capabilities available to the Israeli defense establishment in order to meet uh, these uh, challenges. The Middle East is a tough neighborhood. It is well known. And in the current situation, uh, we look at the challenges in a way that the ongoing geopolitical earthquake uh, in the last five years, years or so is a great challenge for the Middle Eastern, for Israel, and for the entire globe. What we see today is uh, endless hostilities in the region as a result of the collapse of what we call the nation state system, I would say the artificial nation state system, like in Iraq or Syria, Yemen or Libya, uh, in a way that uh, the internal conflict, whether it is Shia versus Sunnis, which is the uh, most significant conflict in the region, or between the Sunnis the Sunnis between themselves, Daesh, ISIS, or Jabhat al-Nusra, as they call today Jabhat al-Fatah al-Sham, other jihadist elements, moderate Sunnis, Kurds, whatever, tribal conflicts in Libya. I don't see the end of it, and I believe that in order to be realistic, we should assume that the Middle East is going to suffer from chronic instability for a very, very long period of time. I don't see the equilibrium which might end it. I don't see even the uh, last experiment to reach ceasefire in Syria as a possible one. And let's wait and see. We are in the midst of this, uh, the implementation of this agreement, but zero chances to reach ceasefire in Syria even with this experiment. What we in Israel have realized that we have to look at the situation in a very realistic, sober, I would say, responsible way. Avoiding two elements which I believe are part of the problem. The way that Western like-minded people and others are looking to the Middle East. We try to avoid wishful thinking. We try to avoid patronism. I don't believe in uh, forcing the Middle Easterns to have nation state system as it happened after World War I and we see the uh, failure of it. And I don't believe in forcing the Middle Easterns to go to democracy by elections because we want it. And we want to have more democracies in the region. We can offer it, we can promote it, we can't force them, not talking about doing it just by elections. It's a long process, of course, based on education. You can't make it but just by elections. It might take decades, generations, or even more, if at all. So the way that we look at the situation, first of all, we don't want to intervene in their internal conflict. Even in Syria, we don't say publicly whether we are for Assad or against Assad. We don't want to intervene. On the other hand, we have very clear red lines demonstrating our interests. And that's what we do in Syria. In one hand, we do not intervene, or the other hand, we introduced our red lines like we are not tolerant to any violation of our sovereignty in the Golanites, and when it happens, we act using the big stick. We do not tolerate any delivery of advanced weapons to our enemies in the region, and when it happens, we use the big stick. And of course, we do not tolerate any delivery of chemical agents to our enemies in the region, it hasn't happened yet. On the other hand, we do approach the villagers across the border, providing them humanitarian support. In order to avoid the phenomena of refugees 
fleeing to Jordan, to Lebanon, to Turkey, to Europe today, we provide their humanitarian needs on their, in their homes. Medical treatment, food, fuel, whatever they need. So this is a sticks and carrot policy. And looking around our country of today, I believe that the result of this policy along the borders and inside Israel regarding the uh, Palestinian terror, we enjoy relatively calm situation security-wise. Looking to the border with Lebanon, peace and tranquility. Here and there, Hezbollah challenged us after blaming us for intercepting delivery of weapons from Syria to Lebanon, or after blaming us for targeting uh, well-known uh, terrorists like Jihad Mourania, Samir Kuntar, and other, or Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps activists, to include Iranian general. Otherwise, peace and quiet. And when even they challenge us, they did it in a very modest way to avoid escalations, meaning Hezbollah is deterred from going to any hostilities with the state of Israel for meanwhile. And this is the case along the border uh, with, Lebanon, with Syria. We haven't observed even single Sunni jihadist attack from the Syrian side. We did absorb about a dozen of IRGC proxies attacks from the Syrian side until a couple of months ago, so far over. But you have to pay attention to the Iranian involvement in Syria. And I will elaborate about the Iranian presence in the region. We enjoy strategic relationship with Jordan and Egypt. Unprecedented, based on common interests. And today we even enjoy a relatively calm situation security-wise along the border with the Gaza Strip, as we call it, Hamastan, as a result of responsible, reasonable, realistic policy. Big sticks against those who try to provoke rocket launching, especially Daesh and other, and even against Hamas as we uh, hold Hamas as accountable for the security or for the situation in the Gaza Strip. <coughs> and on the other hand, carrots, yes, the Gaza Strip is dependent on Israel by all means, commodities, water, electricity, quite confused situation. But it is manageable. And the communities around the Gaza Strip enjoy unprecedented peace and tranquility. They are looking for more apartments, more citizens. This is the right way to manage this kind of situation. Even in dealing with the situation in Judea Samaria, the West Bank, <coughs> we observed in the last year uh, attacks, ex exactly from last year, from last September, <coughs> Rosh Hashanah, in our case. It started with three to four stabbing, slamming, shooting attacks per day. Looking to the current situation, very different. How come? Using the big stick against the individuals, allowing the entire population to live in dignity, to enjoy well-being, and not to push them to the corner. That's what I mean, realistic, reasonable, sober policy uh, in order to meet our security challenges. But looking to the regi region, no doubt that in the current situation for Israel, Iran is the main threat. Iran is still the main generator and instigator for instability in the region. As I mentioned, the dozens or so attacks perpetrated from the Syrian side of the Golanites against us. It was Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps proxies trying to open a terror front against us. But this is the case vis-a-vis -vis Hezbollah as Iranian strategic arm 
armed with more than 100,000 rockets and missiles, but deterred. And this is the situation with Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad in the Gaza Strip, financed today by Iran, the military wing, as we call it, getting know-how how to produce the rockets, more accurate rockets, or even unmanned air vehicles. This is Iran as regard to the state of Israel. As, as you know, we don't share any border with Iran. We don't occupy any Iranian territory whatsoever. And they still call to wipe Israel off the map of the earth. And this is in the backdrop of the deal, which in a way, yes, there is a delay in the technological clock of the Iranian nuclear project. This is the only achievement. The entire consequences are very bad. First of all, the Iranian regime still keep the indigenous capabilities to produce a bomb. And they'll be able to do it whenever they will decide, but even by, by obeying the deal, the agreement, they'll be allowed to do it within a decade, 15 years. Still big issue to discuss here between Israel and the United States about what should be done in order to prevent a military nuclear Iran by one way or another. Then we have, of course, the Iranian violations of United Nations Security Council as regard to proliferation of arms. They deliver weapons to rogue elements in the region on a daily basis. We have hard evidence, not just to Hezbollah or certain militias in Iraq or in, in Syria, to the Houthis in Yemen. They undermine regimes, especially Sunni regimes in the region, like in Bahrain or in Saudi Arabia, Dharan, and they still keep terror infrastructure in five continents, to include North America, South America, Asia, Africa, Europe, and so forth. This is the Iranian regime after the deal. And unfortunately, this regime is perceived today as more moderate, ready to be open to the West. I don't see McDonald in Tehran whatsoever in the current situation. <coughs> and of, of course, there are those who perceive this regime as part of the solution. Why? Because they are ready to fight Daesh. So what? Of course they are ready to fight Daesh, Shias versus Sunnis. But what about gaining dominance, if not hegemony, in the region, exploiting the deal? They are, they are already hegemonic in Beirut. Lebanon has been abducted by the Iranian regime. The government, the government of Lebanon has nothing to do with any decision to go to war with Israel. It will be up to Khamenei. And I, now, now they try to gain dominance in Damascus by supporting Bashar al-Assad. <coughs> and of course in Baghdad with the Shia government and in Sana'a in Yemen uh, using the Houthis as, as proxy. This is the Iranian regime. Nothing has been changed to exclude the delay in the nuclear project. <coughs> and that's why we uh, emphasize the Iranian threat and uh, we find ourselves in disputes with our allies to include here in Washington. Looking in a broader perspective to the Middle East, we believe that there are for Israel also opportunities. And generally speaking, the Middle East of today is divided geopolitically, first of all, by the Iranian camp, led by Khamenei, very solid, to include Bashar al-Assad regime and Hezbollah in Lebanon, other Shia elements, Shia militias in the region, unfortunately in Syria today, supported by Russia. Then we have the Muslim Brotherhood camp, uh, absorbing a blow after the counter-revolution in, uh, in Egypt, led by Erdogan in Turkey, a member of NATO, unfortunately. 
Of course, including Hamastan in the Gaza Strip, uh, Muslim Brotherhood parties in, in the region, quite a small and weak camp today. We have the global, global Jihad uh, camp to include all Sunni jihadists, Daesh, uh, Al-Qaeda, whatever. And we have the Sunni Arab camp. And in a way, Israel and the Sunni Arab camp today are on the same boat. On the same boat because, first of all, we share common enemies. Iran is our common enemy. The Shia Axis is our common em enemy. They declared Hezbollah as terror organization, not yet by the European Union. <coughs> Muslim Brotherhood, common enemy. For them, internal enemy. For us, Hamastan in Gaza Strip. And of course, global jihad element, although part of them will be, will have been assisted by certain Sunni regimes, now it's common enemy. Launching airstrikes by them, cooperating with the US-led coalition in fighting uh, Daesh. So in this regard, there are also opportunity. My bottom line is my opening remarks that we have to look to the situation in the Middle East in a, in a realistic way. Avoiding in one hand wishful thinking, on the other hand, patronism. And looking to our very interests. It might be that will be different perspective from Jerusalem and Washington. But we believe that we are on the same page, not on the same boat when it comes to common interest. And it should be very clear in any strategy on which side the United States is standing, with Iran or with the Sunnis, as an example. And what should be done in order to manage the conflicts in the region? It's very important word to myself managing and not wishful thinking of solving. There is no way to solve like that all these problems or meeting the challenges. We have to manage our strategy in a way that our interest in the region will be enhanced. And I believe that this is the right way in order to meet the challenges for all of us. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much. So um, I'm going to have the pleasure of uh, posing a few questions back and forth with, uh, with our guest. And then after that, I'll open up the, the conversation to all of you. Um, what, well, we're turning on Mike? So, it's great. Uh, so, Boogie, you, your opening remark had to do with the, uh, the U.S.-Israel MOU. Um, uh, which is, of course, today's news. So I want to ask you um, a question about the MOU and then uh, something about President Obama's remarks in the context of the MOU. First, about the MOU. Um, uh, a, a, um, uh, another Israeli defense minister, um, Ehud Barak, um, had an op-ed in today's Washington Post in, uh, in which he said, MOU, good job, but we could have done better. Um, we could have done better if we, if we approached uh, Washington in a different way over the Iran nuclear deal. There was money left on the table. Um, uh, uh, we could have done better. What's your view? I don't want to go to our internal disputes regarding the MOU. Having said that, we are glad that we got, first of all, the capabilities available to the Israeli defense uh, establishment, which actually I concluded it with uh, my counterpart, the Secretary of Defense, Ash Carter, on October 2015. A list of capabilities available to our country. Uh, 
to put it in the right perspective, I don't believe that uh, 38 billion dollars can afford all the capabilities or all the needs. So now we will have to go through prioritization process in Israel to decide what we can get, what we prefer to leave alone. Uh, the internal debate, which has been mentioned by Ehud Barak in his piece in the Washington Post, I prefer to deal with it in my country. Okay, fair enough. Um, in his remarks uh, around the signing of the MOU, uh, President Obama uh, 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 sort of balanced his contribution to Israel's security with a comment about the urgency of resolving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, uh, and in doing so, he, he reiterated an idea which one hears quite frequently, which is that when all is said and done, the most urgent and serious threat to Israel is the failure to resolve this conflict, and um, uh, Israel will only find security if it does everything it can to solve this conflict as soon as possible. What's your view? This is one of the disputes. <laughs> I wish to solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I don't believe that it is going to happen in the coming future. And I'm the one who supported Oslo before I knew the details when I became the head of the intelligence under late Mr. Rabin in 95, I realized that there is no chance to conclude the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in the way that has been proposed in Oslo. Why? It's very simple, you know. If you educate your young generation to hate the Jews after signing the Oslo Accord and to believe that Palestine is from the Mediterranean Sea to the Jordan River and there, and there is no room for a Jewish state. And you educate your kids to wear explosive belts and to kill the Jews. This is not the way for coexistence and reconciliation. And that was my personal political awakening, let's call it like that. And I shared it with late Mr. Rabin. Uh, uh, it's a long story. Nevertheless, there are too many misconceptions, especially among Western like-minded people regarding this conflict. First of all, what is the core of the conflict? It is not occupation since 67. It's about their reluctance to recognize our right to exist as a nation state of the Jewish people in any boundaries. I can prove it. And Abu Mazen says it again and again and again. We can't ignore it. He's not ready to say even two, pe two states for two peoples. He denies the existence of the Jewish people. He claims Judaism, big religion, it's neither people with no nationality. So why should the religion have a state? It's very basic. He hasn't said that if we reach any final settlement based on, generally speaking, roughly speaking, 67 lines, it will be considered as the end of Clancy's finality of claims. We can't ignore it. And there are some other misconceptions, and unfortunately, one of them, which proved to be very wrong in the last five years, <coughs> we still hear it, that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is a core for instability in the Middle East. It is ridiculous. What is the connection between the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the ongoing war in, in Syria? with a toll of uh, almost half a million casualties and uh, so many refugees. It's not because of us. And this is the case with the conflict in Iraq and in Yemen and in, in, in Libya and, and, and the revolution, counter-revolution in Egypt. No linkage to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Yes, there is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. As I don't believe that we can solve it because of the huge gap that I just mentioned and there are many other gaps. Uh, again, I don't believe that we can solve it. We have to manage it. How to manage it? We had uh, slogans in Israel. It was, land for peace. Not anymore. 
That's why you see in the Israeli public the move from what is called the left to the right. I call it right or wrong, but nevertheless, this is the case. <laughs> <coughs> but, uh, you know, any piece of territory which was delivered to the responsibility of the Palestinian Authority after Oslo, it became to be homicide bomber's launcher. For those who believed that by going to Oslo we'll reach peace and tranquility, like myself, we have been frustrated. 1,500 casualties. And in Gaza, when Sharon decided to do it unilaterally because he saw that there was no partner, but we had to do it, what did we get? <coughs> Peace and tranquility or rockets launching pad. Not dealing with 67 lines, dealing with Tel Aviv as a settlement, targeting Tel Aviv. And this is unfortunately the case. So for those who believe that uh, they know the solution, well-known solution, just to have to push the two sides and then to reach it, they are very, very wrong. So my proposal is, it, is it what I did as a defense minister. Let's manage the conflict and improving the situation from the bottom up. I know there are those even in Israel calling for full separation, high fence, making good neighbors. Let's make it unilateral as we did it in Gaza. They didn't learn the lesson of Gaza, disengagement. How come? I claim that the Palestinians are dependent on the state of Israel. And if they will go to full separation, they will die. People will say, why do we care? It will create humanitarian crisis. It will create security challenge, like in Gaza. Why do we provide water and electricity to Gaza? Because of that. <clears throat> so how can you separate the economies? Where is the, where is the center of gravity of the Palestinian economy? <coughs> it's not in Ramallah, not talking about Gaza. It used to be in the Gulf until 91. 400,000 Palestinians were employed there, sending the money to their families. Today it is in Tel Aviv. Not incidentally, we have the same currency, the shekel. Common economic system. 100,000 Palestinians are employed in Israel. This is a real economy, not the donor, not the donations. 60,000 are employed in the settlement in the Israeli industrial zone in Judea and Samaria. Many of them are employed as subcontractors of Israeli enterprises. And the export of the Palestinian market 88% of it is to the Israeli market. How can we separate? Not talking about infrastructure, water, electricity, security. Abu Mazen can't survive a day without our security activities. Yes, we have to say it. They do part of the job. We do most of the job in fighting Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, Daesh, in, Daesh, in Judah and Samaria. If we lose this freedom of operation, of the Israeli Defense Forces, ISA, Shabak, the Israeli Security Agency. Abu Mazen is going to be defeated by Hamas immediately like it happened in Gaza. So, can we talk about full separation, hyphens making good neighbors? Not in the Middle East. So that's why I claim that we have to come with new ideas rather than the old one. Managing the conflict from the bottom up to improve the economy, the infrastructure, the security, and the governance as well. To be very clear, I don't want to govern them. And if we reached a, a, a political separation, this is an achievement of Oslo. <coughs> they enjoy political independence. They have their own parliament, government, president, municipalities. I don't want them to vote to the Knesset. And this is the only way to manage the conflict in the right direction. I believe that many of them understand it. And that's why we witness good cooperation, security-wise, of course, economic cooperation. They know that they are dependent on us. This is the only way that I believe is realistic to deal with this conflict. Um, a, a different comment that uh, 
that President Obama said uh, uh, not too long ago um, about another area of dispute uh, between the United States and Israel concerned the Iran nuclear agreement, where President Obama said um, that um, uh, even many Israeli national security figures today now recognize that the Iran nuclear agreement, that I was right, basically, he said, that the Iran nuclear agreement even works in Israel's benefit, and they now even recognize this. Um, uh, you, you offered a pretty strong critique of this, so I think it's fair to say that you're not one of those national security figures that he was talking about. Is that correct? I don't, I don't know about any of them. <laughs> because I, I personally said that there is, the good news about the deal is a technological delay in the project. But I, had, I added something else. This is the only good news. The entire are very bad. Uh, for the first time since uh, you, your early military service, um, Russian, then Soviet, now Russian uh, forces are operating on Israel's border. Uh, can you tell us a bit about how you see what the Russians are up to, what Russian strategy is, how, your, how Israel is dealing with this, and where do you think uh, Russian ambitions really are in, uh, in this part of the world? The declared uh, Russian objectives in, in Syria, first of all, are very clear. And we heard it. Uh, they don't want to have another failed state, like it happened in Iraq after toppling the regime, or in Libya after getting rid of Muammar Gaddafi. And they believe that in order to keep stability, the uh, Bashar al-Assad regime in this case should be kept in power. That's one objective. The second one is that uh, 2,000 uh, Russian spoken jihadists are deployed in, in Syria. And he prefers to kill, to kill them on Syrian soil rather than on Russian soil. <laughs> The hidden agenda, to my mind, is uh, not so hidden, uh, is about the superpowers game. He's back on the uh, stage. The second is to direct the, tension, the attention from Ukraine to Syria. Why not? Another one is influence in the region by having military uh, facilities like the seaport in Tartus, intelligence facilities uh, in, 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 in Syria, and uh, to be a player in the region in a way which actually is used uh, in the region. I am loyal to my allies, not like someone else who abandoned Mubarak and abandoned Assisi and abandoned the Sunni regimes in the region. And, uh, and then, of course, it's an opportunity to demonstrate the Russian military capabilities all over the world. There is not really a need to launch ballistic missile from the Mediterranean Sea, from a submarine on the surface to be used uh, in, in Syria, but it is uh, uh, an opportunity to demonstrate the capabilities and to test the capabilities as well. Uh, I thought, and uh, we, we knew that he thought uh, about uh, launching uh, or deploying his troops for about three months, uh, launching an offensive, and that's it. It's a year, already a year, without significant success. To exclude the uh, fact that Bashar al-Assad has been strengthened as a result of it, and to my mind, is going to contribute to the continuation to the war rather than to conclude any kind of uh, victory on the ground or political settlement. And it makes the situation very complicated. That's why I don't believe in the ceasefire. There are so many contradictory interests in, in Syria of today. 
whether it is uh, the United States, uh, the Sunni regimes, Turkey, uh, Russia, Iran from outside, not talking about the internal situation, uh, the uh, bloodshed, uh, the, uh, the contradictory interest of uh, the Alawites, the Kurds, the different Sunni factions and other. So I don't see the equilibrium to conclude it. And that's why I believe that the end, Russia should, will have to take the decision when to get out of this uh, quagmire before sinking in. Nevertheless, as regard to Russia and Israel, uh, we are glad that we, the Cold War is over. We have diplomatic relationship. And when we realized that Russia was going to deploy its, uh, especially aircraft and other uh, military capabilities in Syria, we decided to have any kind of contact in order to avoid, first of all, misunderstanding and accidents. <coughs> so it's not even deconflinction. Deconflinction meaning that you operate together. We don't operate together. It's not coordination. We don't tell them what we are going to do and don't, to, don't tell us what they are going to do. It's a system which based on actually a hotline. Uh, one uh, uh, one p side of the hotline is in uh, Latakia or in the south of Latakia in the Russian headquarters in Syria. The other side is in Tel Aviv. Both sides uh, Russian speakers. <laughs> <laughs> in order to avoid incident and accident like it happened with, with Turkey. And let's wait and see what will come come out from this strategy in Syria, which it's a real tragedy. Okay. Um, uh, if, if you haven't heard during your month here in Washington, we have a presidential election going on. <laughs> um, now I'm not going to ask you to, uh, to uh, endorse one or the other candidate, but I do want to ask you what you would like to hear from either the candidates in their debates or what you would like to hear from the new president that gets elected in November. What would be the most important things that you would like to hear? I gave a couple of clues in my opening remarks, but generally speaking, I believe that there is a need for a new U.S. grand strategy in the Middle East. Uh, and. Uh, I will have the opportunity. I have the opportunities, and I will have the opportunity to share my views with my counterpart here. So I prefer not to do it publicly. But generally speaking, I recommend to avoid wishful thinking, to avoid patronism, to look at the situation in a very realistic way, not looking for instant solution, which is another biased way to look at the our challenges and to try to manage the situation in a way that it will be very clear what are our interests of the United States, of course, sharing it with Israel, sharing it with the Sunni regimes in the region, which I believe should have been part of this camp. Putting it very clear that the United States is not with Iran, very clear, it's very important. And by this compass, operating in Syria, operating in Iraq, operating in the entire region in order to serve this kind of interest. It's a long way to reach stability. It's a very long way, but there are many chances to enhance our interest by doing or uh, misdoings uh, in, in, in the region. Okay. Uh, one last question before I turn the floor over to, uh, to the audience. Um, I have to ask you the political question to get it out of the way. Um, uh, 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 you're not just a, uh, a brilliant political uh, a security analyst and uh, former strategist and former minister of defense. Um, uh, 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 you have said that you um, um, are preparing yourself for um, uh, um, potential further leadership in your country. Uh, can you say something to, uh, to the audience here about your own plans when you return back to Israel? Uh, I don't wash, want to, to wash our laundry abroad. <laughs> Having said that, it's clear that I had a couple of clashes in the last year, especially in the last year, regarding certain uh, very important elements to myself, 
in my country regarding how to keep Israel as Jewish and democratic state. And uh, of course, uh, to do it uh, according to our values. And uh, that is what is in stake. Uh, going back even to Ehud Barak peace, I don't agree with him on everything, but on this part of the peace, I do agree with him. <coughs> Nevertheless, uh, uh, I, uh, I'm not escaping responsibility, and that's why in my resignation speech, May uh, this year, I declare that I'm ready to run to our national leadership. And I prepare myself to the next round of elections. Uh, so far, using my political break to work uh, via NGO, promoting my ideas, my thoughts regarding the future of my country. And then before the elections, to, to go through any political uh, uh, tool, which might be a party, cooperation between parties, to try to win the elections in a way that will be able to lead the country the way that I believe in. Okay, very good. Um, all right, so I'm going to turn to, to your questions. As I, as I do this, I do want to just take the opportunity, uh, since I have a captive audience, of, uh, of introducing um, um, uh, the new fellows who are here at the Washington Institute um, uh, from, uh, from northern Iraq, uh, Bilal Wahab, um, from Egypt, uh, um, Haysom Hussainen, um, and from, uh, from Israel, Ehud Ya'ari, uh, back uh, <laughs> for another visit. Um, so um, uh, we have quite a, quite a breadth of expertise here at the Institute. Please feel free to call on them and all of our fellows um, for your Middle East uh, questions and issues. I'll turn now to my, my, uh, my colleague, David Makovsky. If you could please wait for a microphone to head to you, uh, keep your questions brief, um, uh, and um, uh, we'll be able to get to as many as possible. So David's up in front. Thanks. Thank you very much, Rob. Thank you, Bogey. Um, could you drill down a little more when you talk about American leadership over the Sunni camp? Uh, if you go country by country, what do you expect from the United States to do that it isn't already doing in asserting this leadership? I will show you what I understand is the feeling among the Sunni regimes in the region. It's a great frustration from the Iranian deal, although publicly they expressed it in another way, from the fact that uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guard core elements are able now to play uh, with them in Bahrain, in, in Dharan, in Saudi Arabia, undermining the regimes over there. And of course, uh, what is going on now in Yemen? Houthis, which is uh, Iranian uh, uh, Shia uh, proxy, uh, took over Yemen, Sana'a. In a way, the Sunnis, uh, in, in, in quite a new fashion, uh, has mobilized the coalition to fight them on the ground, not like paying to proxies to fight for them, but uh, uh, being ready to fight back and uh, it's a Saudi-led Saudi coalition, which had become more proactive. This is part of the frustration. <coughs> Even the, uh, the deal in, uh, in Syria this week, uh, in a way, none of the Shia elements is uh, required to do anything, but from the Sunni camp, uh, targeting certain elements, whether jihadists, uh, not jihadists, it doesn't matter yet. But this, this kind of uh, strategy, policy, uh, creating a lot of frustration in, in the region. Not talking about what had happened in Egypt with Mubarak, later on with Assisi. It was not clear cut uh, this, the regime is supported. In, in, on the other hand, there was a feeling that the Muslim Brotherhood was supported by the United States. So there are many reasons for this kind of frustration among the Sunnis in the region, which should be dealt with and to be responded, uh, I believe, by another U.S. strategy. So more U.S. military assistance. More U.S. military assistance in Yemen. 
uh, it's not just it's not just military assistance. No, I'm not talking just an, and 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 you know there are so many elements who are ready to fight in the region. I don't call the United States to deploy boots on the ground whatsoever. To assist by airstrikes, that's fine. To assist by intelligence, that's fine. To be on the right side politically, first of all. It is not so clear today in the region. Uh, Buggy, you earlier said that, uh, uh, that Israel and the Sunni states are basically in the same camp. There are those who suggest that, uh, that there's even an opportunity to take that reality and transform it into something more formal, peace between Israel and the Sunni camp. Are you a believer in the idea that, that there is this opportunity out there to formalize Israel's relations with Sunni states? I wish to, to have this kind of uh, declared peace, but you know, we have uh, strategic relations with Jordan and Egypt. We can't call it normalization. We can't call it normalization. Part of it because of the way that they're educating the young generations. And we see it, we witness it. You know, on the very high level, there is understanding of the uh, uh, benefits from the relationship with Israel. On the other hand, they have problems in getting it down because of the way that they educated their people to hate us. That's one of the internal challenges in any Arab country of today. We see uh, signs of trying to change it in the media, even to speak uh, publicly about certain relationship and cooperation, not with all the country, but it's a long way to, 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 to lead the people, their people, which were educated to hate us, to get along with us. Uh, Ori Nir in the center, now move around. Mike right in the middle. Put your hand up again. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Um, my, my question is the following. Uh, uh, most of your reservations regarding uh, conflict resolution with the Palestinians, why you choose to, to manage the conflict rather than resolve it, have to do with attitudes of the Palestinian leadership. And my question is, if um, the elected leader of the Palestinian people, Abbas, would come tomorrow and allay those concerns that you have, he would, you know, uh, check all the boxes that you have uh, mentioned earlier, would that make you pivot from conflict management to conflict resolution? And if not, what are the conditions? What, what would yeah. it take for you to make that pivot? Because I'm sure that you're not advocating continuing with the status quo forever. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, this is a hypothetical question. I don't see a potential Palestinian leadership which will lead the uh, Palestinian Authority, not talking about Hamas, in a different way. Having, uh, 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 having said that, if you want to convince me that we have partner in the Palestinian side, I will look at the Palestinian education curriculum, the textbooks. That was the point in summer 95 in which I went to late Mr. Rabin in one of my meetings as the head of the intelligence, I had uh, every two weeks a uh, working meeting with the Prime Minister. And I said, Mr. Prime Minister, I have to warn you. This is a strategic early warning. I don't see any sign for reconciliation on the Palestinian side. And I didn't have to use more sophisticated intelligence sources in order to realize it. I just had to open the Palestinian textbooks, and this is the case till now. It hasn't been changed. Or to watch the... Uh, TV program for the kids. When I will see change in that, I will say, wow, might be another leadership. I don't see it so far. Uh, yes, right here, please. <clears throat> Thanks. Hi, Aaron. <coughs> Excuse me, Aaron Meadow with Defense News. Uh, you said that you didn't believe $38 billion is enough to be able to do all of the modernization and, and new buying acquisition that you want to do. Congress has said, at least some members of Congress have said, they're open to 
trying to add more money for Israel under the MOU. In your mind, what is the appropriate amount that's necessary to do what you want? And secondly, uh, there's a long held up jet fighter sale to Qatar and to Kuwait. Reportedly, that was tied into Israel uh, being able to sign the MOU in the first step of that. Now that that's signed, do you imagine those jet sales will be going through? I don't like this reservation in the, uh, in the agreement, in the understanding, in the MOU of uh, having it as a ceiling. And I don't believe it will be a ceiling. Why? Because uh, usually in the Congress, uh, first of all, Israel has support. Secondly, there are uh, interest of the congressmen to bring in work to their uh, constituencies, to their states. And this is one of the reasons that they come with these ideas of uh, providing additional money to manufacture whatever it will be, whether it is uh, MBD, the missile uh, ballistic uh, defense, or the, t the tunnels as it happened uh, recently. I believe that it will happen in the future as well. Uh, the uh, the sale of planes to uh, any linkage between the sale of planes to Arab states and the MOU? Uh, you know, uh, Israel in certain cases has reservations regarding the arms deal to the Arab countries. Uh, in order to avoid reservations, it should be coordinated with Israel in order to keep the qualitative military edge. And in this case, probably there is a linkage. Uh, Sarah in the center. Sarah Stern, Endowment for Middle East Truth. Um, many times in death, people become a lot larger than in life. You had the honor and privilege of knowing um, the late Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. And many people on the left are using him and, um, as an icon and saying that Yitzhak Rabin would have gone further. In your friendship and relationship with Yitzhak Rabin, were there any red lines that you could talk about? So Sarah's question was, um, uh, uh, when we think back about what Rabin was, both peacemaker and security hawk. What do you recall were his red lines in terms of his approach to the Palestinian issue? I just have to quote uh, late Mr. Rabin's speech in the Knesset a month before his unfortunate assassina assassination. It was the 5th of October, 95, when he brought to the approval of the Knesset the second part of uh, Oslo. And he said, the Palestinian entity will be less than a state. We are not going to withdraw to 67 line because it's no defensible borders. The Israeli uh, settlement clusters will be under Israeli sovereignty. And the Jordan, Rev, Re, uh, Jordan Valley as a whole, in the, as he said, in the broader or wider interpretation of the term Jordan Valley, meaning going back to Alon land, from the Jordan River to the mountains, will be under Israeli sovereignty. And Jerusalem will stay unified together. That was Rabin. Today probably will be uh, considered as right-wing extremist. Uh, Jay Solomon, uh, Wall Street Journal, up in front. Here's a mic. I have a question sort of far afield. It's on. It's yeah. on. How, how concerned are you about what's going on with North Korea? The Chinese think they might have 40 nuclear weapons by the end of, you know, in the next year. There's talk of three more tests. And given the North Koreans' close cooperation with Iran, Syria, Hezbollah in the past decades. Does this cause you a real concern as far as how it could impact Israel's security, this kind of un, this aggressive expansion of the North Korean nuclear program? Jay fears you don't have enough problems in your immediate neighborhood. <laughs> 
The way that we look at our security situation is, first of all, we should be able to defend ourselves by ourselves. Yes, we are grateful that we have the U.S. support, but we don't want American uh, soldiers to fight for us. And uh, in this regard, the way that we built the force, the built up of our military power, is based on looking for anyhow qualitative military edge, not just provided by the United States, provided by our defense industry. Looking to the list of uh, uh, what was called the 100 uh, uh, significant uh, defense industries all over the world, our four uh, uh, defense industries are in this list. And uh, we are privileged to have this kind of uh, state-of-the-art technology based on what I call our well-known secret, our, our minds and our hearts, knowledge and spirit. Knowledge to be able to produce, uh, to be the first all over the world to produce unmanned air vehicles to have uh, uh, certain capabilities which are unique to defend our country from uh, missiles and rockets. It's a four-layer system. It's Iron Dome, the David Sling, Aero um, uh, 2, Aero 3. In all of it, yes, there is knowledge and spirit. And by keeping this advantage, qualitative military edge, we can deter our enemies in a way that even Daesh, you know, I mentioned that we haven't absorbed a single attack from Daesh from the Golan Heights, although they are on the border. And nine months ago, they were asked by a German uh, journalist, why don't you uh, engage with Israel? Why don't you attack uh, the Israelis? They are over the fence, over the border. They said, we don't, don't want to deal with them. It's too dangerous. Yeah. It's meaning deterrence. So if we look to the future to be ready to the threat from, generated from Iran, for this element in the region, or, you know, even from other countries in which we today, on the, I mentioned, on the same boat, it might be changed. It's a matter of uh, interest and intentions. So we should be ready to deal with any capabilities in the end of any potential enemy in the region. That's the way that we build up the force. That's the way that we are ready to be engaged. First of all, our preference is not to have hostilities, to delay as, as far as possible any hostilities. But when it happens, to use our big stick effectively in a way that the outcome of this wave of hostilities will bring about more deterrence. This is my explanation for the peace and quiet situation in, in, along the border with, with Lebanon as well as with Gaza after the military operation of 2014. So on the, on the far right, uh, Michael. Thanks, Rob. Uh, you mentioned uh, answering another question, uh, that you don't believe it'll be a ceiling, the 38 million, because you have friends in Congress. But the final product of the MOU requires Israel to basically write a check back if Congress appropriates funds above and beyond what's been allocated. So what is Congress's, in your view, what is its role uh, going forward in determining aid? Can you repeat? Um, so his, his question was um, um, more specifically, if the MOU requires Israel to return any additional funds that uh, Congress allocates in the, uh, just for a couple of years actually, um, then how do you think, what, what, how do you think Congress can assist Israel during this period? You know, it's up to the uh, politics here but as I said, uh, answering the previous uh, question, uh, I wish that this organization will, will be 
part of the MOU. But if it happens, I hope that we'll be able to get uh, what our needs in the time of needs, even by uh, sharing uh, common interests with congressmen here in, uh, in, in the United States. Okay. Um, Maury in the center. And then uh, can you bring a mic to Joel in the far back? Just put your hand up so the mic goes to you. This okay, is a, really a follow-up on the good question that was just asked. What you have here is, in effect, and I've got conflicting opinions on it, is that uh, Israel would have to refuse any extra aid beyond the limits in the current, uh, current MRU appropriated by the Congress. I mean, this raises all kinds of political and constitutional problems, but are you aware of the details of this? I've been unable to get it from people involved uh, in the negotiation. I believe this is your challenge, not my challenge now. <laughs> Joel in the back. Hi, Joel Rosenberg, author. Uh, we're 15 years now since the 9-11 attacks, and just big picture, strategic perspective from you, are we winning overall uh, the war against uh, radical Islamic terrorism? And, uh, and specifically with ISIS, are we, are we containing them, as, uh, as some are saying, or, or are they, they expanding? What's, what's your perspective? And specifically with Jordan, what is, what is there? You say you're not at, at risk, Israel, right now, but do you see Jordan so close to the situation in any specific uh, danger? So big picture and then Jordan. Uh, so far, Jordan, the Ashimat Kingdom is, is stabilized. And uh, they get the assistance from the neighboring countries in order to be able to defend themselves. The only threat might be from within. It's not the case so far because of the success of the security apparatus to quell any intention, whether by ISIS or Daesh element and other uh, jihadists. And so uh, the Hashemite kingdom is, is stabilized. Uh, regarding the Iranian involvement, you know, I read this piece of uh, the Iranian uh, foreign affairs minister, uh, Mr. Zarif, uh, blaming Wahhabism for instability in the region. Uh, you know, it's quite uh, amazing to read this piece, ignoring all the Iranian rogue activities on the region and beyond. We observe two Iranian perpetrated terror attacks in Argentina. Um, some other places like in Thailand, in Burgas, in Bulgaria, in, uh, in, in, in Thailand, and, uh, and in Georgia, in India. This is the nature of this uh, regime. Not talking about the Iranian involvement in the uh, devastating attacks against the uh, U.S. Marines in, in, in Beirut, going back to 1983. Uh, and all these kind of activities, ongoing activities in keeping terror infrastructure all over the globe. And talking about the clash between Sunnis and Shias in the region, we see the IRGC, the Iran Revolutionary Guard Corps, everywhere. We see them in Lebanon. We see them in Syria. We see them in Iraq, we see them in Yemen, in Bahrain, in, in Saudi Arabia, everywhere we see them. So they are talking about uh, rogue activities, terror uh, activities, and even going back to 9-11. It was well known that Al-Qaeda elements were hosted in Iran, being trained in Iran, uh, used Iran as a safe haven uh, at that time. It's well known. So. Uh, it's very easy to write articles, but you have to look at yourself in the mirror before writing it. And in general, Bogey, when you look back at the 15 years since 9-11, um, do you feel as though we, the collective we, America, the West, Israel, have we generally got it right? Generally, yes. Uh, I believe that uh, what uh, we have done since 9-11 First of all, by improving the cooperation 
between all like-minded intelligence agencies, which was a key to be able to deal with terror, because it's a global terror. If each of us is concentrating on his business and his threats, and not sharing the information, sharing early warning information, that was the case before 9-11, uh, even in the United States. There was no cooperation between the different agencies. So you might have a situation in which the information was in the hand of one agency, not sharing it with another one. Another element which had become very important is legislation. You know, we are in a state of uh, emergency since 48. And the need to have a legislation like the Patriot Act here in, in the United States. I thought in, in advance, you know, in 96, I, I, first of all, in 93, we had a problem with Hamas in the, uh, in, 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 in the Palestinian arena. And we knew about uh, American passport holder, Palestinian, coming to Israel with $600,000, sharing it with a terrorist in the region. We arrested him. And uh, the day after, I met uh, American uh, experts, to include from think tanks as a Judea and Samaria division commander at that time. And I was asked, why don't you launch an airstrike on Hamas headquarters, and that's it. And I asked, do you know where is Hamas headquarters? In Virginia, here. Musa Abu Marzouk was hosted here. And he sent the money for terrorists in Judea and Samaria by his messenger. And because of the legislation here, we couldn't do anything because he was allowed to, to allocate money. It was for charities or whatever. We couldn't do anything. It was changed dramatically after 9-11. This is just one example of how to keep in a democracy, this is a challenge, the balance between, between your security needs and the human rights. And the balance has been changed after 9-11 in favor of security. And we still have to keep it. Okay, thank you. Yes, in front here and right over there. And then Greg over there. Go ahead. Gil Tamari, Channel 10 uh, Israel. Uh, Mr. Yalon, uh, regarding the MOU again, uh, did you think that Israel pay any price uh, confronting the U.S. administration? Uh, the reason I'm asking, on the Iran deal, of course, uh, the reason I'm asking it is because uh, yesterday the Prime Minister's office, uh, in a briefing, uh, actually explain us that uh, the Americans never put on the table any better offer than these $38 uh, billion, dollars, and therefore Israel didn't pay any price for confronting the Obama administration. I prefer not, uh, to, comment, not to comment on it. Let's wait to the books of history. OK, yes. Mr. Minister, thanks again for being here. Uh, coming back to the Ehud Barak article, uh, the first part you said you agreed with, Jewish democratic state. That makes perfect sense. The second part was sort of his formula for getting there, which was Amnon Reshev's Commanders for Israel Security, Security First Plan, uh, one of the key provisions being declaring that there would be no settlement building beyond the barrier and that sort of thing. Um, you said you don't want to govern over the Palestinians, and so, what, what is your assessment of his plan and specifically on that point? <coughs> yes, this is a part that I totally disagree with uh, Ehud Barak, the part of the Israeli-Palestinian track, because uh, what uh, is evident in his, in his proposal that he uh, is ready to uproot Jews, as an example, from, uh, uh, from the territories. And I claim that if we uh, want, and I, we agree that we don't have to govern them. I don't want to govern them. He doesn't want to govern them. But his proposal is to look, to do unilateral steps in order to be disengaged with them, separation. I, 
I shared my criticism about separation earlier, but when it comes to uh, settlements and uh, uprooting Jews, I totally disagree. Why? Because I rejected the disengagement plan from Gaza because of the very bad precedent in which we were ready to uproot 8,000 8, Jews from, uh, from Gush Katif and the other settlements in the northern part of Gaza. It was a bad precedent in a way that I don't want to uproot any Arab from the land of Israel, and I don't want, I'm not ready to uproot any Jew. Both Arabs and Jews have the right to live there. And if you agree to uproot Jews, it means that the Jews doesn't have the right to live there. They don't have the right to live there. I don't agree with it. Now, it's a political issue in which we can agree that people, Jews will be uh, settling here, here, and there. But if you are talking about reconciliation and coexistence between the peoples, how can we talk about uprooting people from their homes? Neither Arabs nor Jews. How can we talk about it? Now, what, come, what came out from the Dishingaden plan by uprooting the Jews? The Palestinians lost 3,700 jobs in Gush Katif, 4,500 jobs in Erz Industrial Dawn. This is the way. This is the way to be paid for the peace. This is the way to actually to see, to say that the Jews don't, don't don't have the right to live wherever they live. And I, I claim that the Arabs have the right to live in the Galilee, in Haifa, in Jaffa, in Jerusalem, in Jenin, in Nablus. I don't want to uproot anyone. Why it has become common knowledge to uproot people from their homes? That's, I totally reject. And I don't believe that to come now with unilateral uh, ideas, it's, it's a good thing. You know, by doing what we did unilaterally in Gaza, the second precedent, rather than putting Jews, was that we are going to withdraw to the last inch to address the territorial grievances like the territorial grievances are the main issue. It has been proven that it is not the main issue. We are not there anymore. Actually, as we address the grievances, there is no reason to go on attacking us, but they go on attacking us, meaning that the, the conflict is not just about 67 lines. It's about Tel Aviv, the big settlement. It's about uh, Erzeliya. It's about uh, our very existence. Occupation not 67, since 48. That's what they're talking about. So I'm not ready to propose any initiative which, which includes withdrawals or uprooting Jews from their homes. I'm not ready. I'm ready to enhance their capabilities to govern themselves, to improve the economy, to do everything, to give them more land in the future. Why not? We should allow to have, by negotiating it. But to come with new uh, uh, Israeli uh, unilateral initiative, I don't agree with it. Can, can I ask you specifically, Bogi, about the question of settlements? Um, because um, uh, uh, it is often said, of course, the phrase of settlements are an obstacle to peace, but putting it into a policy framework, um, uh, uh, the one of the questions on the table today is about future settlement activity. Um, do you have a view on where it is legitimate for the Israeli government to encourage Jews to, s to settle in the future? First of all, I don't agree with those who say Settlements are illegal. I believe that uh, the, Jew, the Jews have the right to live everywhere in the land of Israel. It doesn't mean but that by having political agreement with the Palestinians, we are going to be settled everywhere. It is a political issue, not a judicial issue. From the judicial point of view, the Jews have the right to live everywhere. From the political point of view, we have decided already. Going back to 2003, Sharon, Prime Minister Sharon and President Bush understanding not to construct new settlements rather than the existing settlements, but allowing the existing settlements to grow, natural growth to allow normal life. This is the expression. 
This is our policy in the last seven years, uh, the, the time that I serve in the ministry. What appear to be illegal activities, which I reject totally, uh, private initiative to put caravan here, to settle there, that I, I, I totally rejected and I acted against it. I didn't allow illegal activities, but settlements are approved by the Israeli government from the judicial point of view. It is legal. The political issue is to decide whether to be settled or whether where to be settled, where not to be settled. Uh, Greg F. Tendillion. Uh, Mr. Minister, I was wondering if you could put your analytical hat on and, and think about what, what is the end game for Syria at this point? Is it a collection of many states um, or like an Alawite state in the west or um, a Kurdish state in the north? Or do you think if it, it's ever possible to recreate the Syrian nation state. Thank you. I heard even from a US official claiming that the objective should have been reunification from, for, of Syria. And I said, no way. I know how to make omelet from an egg. I don't know how to make egg from an omelet. And this is in Israel, shakshuka. And uh, we have to get used to a new way of thinking about the Middle East. It might be separated cantons, demographically homogeneous, and it might be confederation at the end, but not in the coming future. That might be equilibrium in the long run. It might be, I'm not sure. We have already Syrian Alawistan. Assad, with all the Iranian, Hezbollah, Russian support, controls not more than 30% of the Syrian territory, former Syrian territory, along the shore and Damascus so far. <clears throat> we have already Syrian Kurdistan in the north. The Druze are concentrated in certain places. They are still loyal to the regime, but it's another demographic canton. And we have the Sunnis all over, more than 160 factions, consists of militias. Few of them jihadists, few of them, not all of them. Most of them are not jihadists. They are Muslims, they are Sunnis, they are not jihadists. That might create which are the vast majority, they are more than 70% of the population of Syria. They might create the biggest canton, they might, or even be separated to different Sunni cantons. But uh, I don't see reunification of Syria in the coming future, as I don't see real reunification of Iraq. We have already Iraqi Kurdistan, we have the Shia, the Sunnis, this conflict, we should find a way to have any kind of confederation, if at all. Otherwise, they will go on fighting each other for a very, very long period of time. Uh, Bogey, okay, I just wanted to ask uh, um, uh, two questions and then bring our session to a close. And I, I apologize to everyone I couldn't get to today. Um, uh, uh, we spoke earlier about leadership in Israel. People often also speak about leadership among the Palestinians, and there are some Israeli politicians who, who uh, uh, like to talk about their favorite candidates to uh, who might be an appropriate uh, leader for the Palestinians, um, whether it's Abu Mazen or somebody else. Um, do you have a view on, uh, on who might best be your partner with the Palestinians, and how would you go about doing that? If you want to harm any potential Palestinian leader, you have to support him. <laughs> and my conclusion from uh, the very bad experience of uh, Lebanon in 1982, in which we decided who will be the president of uh, Lebanon, and of course immediately was assassinated by the Syrians, Israel shouldn't be involved in such activities not even saying publicly that we support this one or that one. Uh, 
we should stay aside, we should look to our interest, and uh, we know how to deal. Even when Hamas took over Gaza, at the end, we found a way to deal with them, with a big stick and the Kurds. We, we know how to deal with it. So we should avoid any intervention in their internal politics. And then uh, just lastly, um, you've painted a very sobering picture of regional realities. Um, uh, Israel has fought three times with Hamas, uh, has fought a couple of times with Hezbollah. Um, uh, uh, when you look over the next half dozen years, um, uh, are you optimistic, are you pessimistic about whether Israel will regrettably have to fight another conflict again? In the Middle East, pessimistic is an experienced optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, <clears throat> so far, so good, not to the end of the days, without illusions. Why it is so far so good? Because we have found a way to manage uh, the uh, situation uh, with vis Hezbollah, with vis Hamas, with vis the other terror uh, organization in a way that we enjoy what I call, first of all, our intelligence dominance, not to allow any early morning information to be materialized to a terror attack. On the other hand, to keep the situation in a way that we don't use just sticks, we use also carrots to allow the people, like in Gaza, as the best example, uh, to, to live in dignity and to enjoy well-being as, as, as far as Hamas is concerned and ready to allow them. But part of Israel, we are ready to allow whatever they need in order to be able to, to live there. Having said that, uh, not in all the cases, the uh, direct engagement between Israel and the uh, parties in the region is the main consideration. I believe that if we will go to hostilities with Lebanon, the decision will be taken in Tehran. Not in Beirut, not by Hassan Nasrallah, by Khamenei. So we have to look at the situation in a broader perspective. Part of uh, our enemies, our proxies, of someone else. That's why I mentioned Iran as a very top priority. And then dealing with the proxies, using this management of uh, sticks and carrots to delay as far as possible, as long as possible, uh, the next round of hostilities. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Moshe Ya'alon. Thank you. Great. Bogey, thank, thank you very you. much.